Number 9. Soviet Ships and Submarines Most of us think of cold, snowy regions as places where people rarely go. But these less than forgiving environments have actually seen a surprising amount of human activity and we've left plenty of evidence behind. Take for example this image of an alleged Soviet nuclear icebreaker almost completely covered in snow and ice. It's just one of many abandoned ships and submarines that can be found throughout Russia. Some of these vessels, including a collection of deserted submarines at Vladivostok, were captured in stunning images taken by photographer and historian Robert Grenville. He published the haunting photos in the 2019 book Abandoned Cold War Places as part of his mission to document the relics of a bygone era before they disappear completely. While preserving history is an honorable cause, it would be a good thing if the many Soviet-era ships littering Russia's Far East and Far North regions disappeared. They're contributing to the wide-scale industrial pollution that threatens the increasingly fragile Arctic environment, which is already overburdened by the effects of climate change. So, as fascinating as these derelict wrecks and half-submerged abandoned vessels are, they're really only harming their surroundings. But even if the Russian government gets serious about removing its Soviet-era pollution, it would take an estimated 15 years or more to completely clean up the toxic messes. It's unfortunately safe to say that any photographer who wants to document these sites has plenty of time left to do so. Number 8. Glitviken Whalers Church The South Georgia and Sandwich Islands are British overseas territories in the southern Atlantic Ocean. They're known for their remoteness and harsh climate. They've seen limited human settlement, including no indigenous population. Some of these islands were once home to seal hunting and whaling stations, during which time their populations peaked. Located at the head of King Edward Cove, Gritviken was South Georgia Island's largest settlement and whaling station. In 1913, a group of Norwegian whalers led by Carl Anton Lassen assembled a pre-built church at Gritviken. Known interchangeably as the Gritviken or Whalers Church, the neo-Gothic style worship site was a member of the Church of Norway. It consists of a single nave and a small altar with a library off to the side and is one of the world's most southern churches. Four different priests served at the church between 1913 and 1931. The first priest, Christen Lücken, wrote that religion wasn't very popular among the whalers and that it left much to be desired. It's not surprising then that the church also served as a food store, cinema, and concert hall over the years. It also hosted a small funeral for ill-fated explorer Ernest Shackleton, who died from a heart attack at Gritviken in 1922 and is buried in the nearby cemetery. The settlement was abruptly abandoned in 1966 when overhunting caused the whaling industry to crash. And while the whalers' church isn't completely abandoned, its day-to-day -day operations ended long ago. It sees limited visitors, including crews and naval ship passengers who occasionally attend religious services and weddings. Number 7. Base W Base W is a former British Antarctic Survey research station on Detai Island off Antarctica's Aerosmith Peninsula. Built in 1956, this small outpost consists of just one long building and a pair of small outer structures. The original plan was for researchers at Base W to travel to the Antarctic mainland by dog sled to conduct studies in meteorology and geology. But the ice surrounding the island was dangerous and unstable. In 1958, the annual freeze blocked the team's supply vessel from reaching them. Even with the help of American icebreakers, it was no use. The team had no choice but to abandon the base. They packed their most important belongings and trekked 25 miles on foot to an awaiting vessel on the mainland. Base W remained untouched until the late 90s when members of the BAS visited it and found it frozen in time. Despite their scramble to get their ship out of Antarctica, the team had taken the time to properly winterize the property. It's still filled with scientific equipment, clothing, books, food, everyday items, furniture and other things that were left behind more than 60 years ago. The doors are left unlocked, and anyone who manages to reach the snow-covered island is free to go inside and look around. Number 6. Lenin Bust The Pole of Inaccessibility is the furthest point in Antarctica from any ocean and where one can expect to find the world's coldest year-round temperature of minus 72.8 degrees Fahrenheit. It is here that the Soviets established a research station in 1958 as a way to one-up the recent construction of the American Amundsen-Scott Station at the South Pole. The base was rather simple and straightforward, consisting of a hut that housed four people, a radio shack, and an electrical hut. There was also a small airstrip, a transmitter, and a diesel power generator. But like any Soviet-sponsored structure of the time, it wouldn't have been complete without a bust of Vladimir Lenin, especially since the 40th anniversary of the Russian Revolution had passed just a year earlier. The bust was mounted on a pyramidal base and positioned to face Moscow. 
Just two weeks after setting up camp, the team left the station, which was deemed too dangerous for permanent operations. The next visit came in 1964, courtesy of the 8th Soviet Antarctic Expedition. As of 2007, the entire base had been buried by snow except for the linen bust, which poked out from the surface as a lone reminder of the short-lived Soviet presence. A team of British and American explorers called N2I went without sleep for 36 hours as they traveled to the site using kites. As they approached from less than four miles away, they noticed a dark dot off in the distance. Naturally, they wondered if sleep deprivation was causing them to see things that weren't there. Once they realized that it was Lennon waiting to greet them, the team bursted into uncontrollable shouts and laughter. That was the last time anyone visited the Pole of Inaccessibility. It's probably safe to assume that the Lennon bust is completely buried in snow by now. Number 5. Dobrovolsky Polar Research Station Built in 1956 in the Wilkes Land region of eastern Antarctica, the AB Dobrovolsky Polar Research Station is one of two polar stations in Antarctica. It was constructed by the Soviets in the Bunger Hills area before being handed over to the Polish Academy of Scientists in 1959. Simply put, the Russians lost interest in using the station due to its difficult-to-reach inland location. That was the last time the base saw regular use. Records show that a team visited periodically between then and 1979, and that the station then became inactive but not abandoned. But for all intents and purposes, it was. For the next 40 years, the property went unused by scientists and was completely devoid of a human presence, minus the occasional group of tourists who managed to reach the remote site. The station consists of two main buildings along with two pavilions and a landing area nine miles away. Their exact condition was unknown until a team of Polish scientists arrived earlier this year. They plan to reactivate and renovate the base, which will be used for studying the Earth's core. Its remote location makes it perfect for this type of research, according to expedition leader Marek Lewandowski. Speaking with Radio Poland, he described the station as a portal to the inside of the Earth, uncontaminated by human activity and seismic waves from the ocean. The team also plans to set up antennas to study the ionosphere. Hey there, and real quick, if you're new to this channel, welcome. Thanks for checking us out, and if you're liking this video, hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons. Number 4. Toxic Pollution Russia's history of Arctic research, industrial facilities, and territorial claims goes back decades. The region saw a lot of human activity during Soviet times when copious amounts of toxic debris and waste accumulated throughout the high north. When these sites were abandoned, the pollution was simply left behind and most of it still languishes today. Coastlines are littered with empty barrels, rusting vehicles and ships, diesel and other fuel, and other long-forgotten scrap metal posing an ever-present threat to the fragile Arctic environment. The Russian Defense Ministry has made at least some efforts to remove the garbage. In 2016, a reported 6,540 tons of harmful waste was removed from the old Soviet sites. And while that may sound like a lot, it's just a morsel of the estimated 5 million tons of industrial trash at the Yakusha region alone. Also known as the Republic of Sakha, Yakusha is Russia's largest region. Speaking with the Siberian Times, Nature Preservation Minister Sahamin Afanasayev said that it would cost around $1 billion to completely eradicate the rubbish. He further pointed out that the country's three-year budget plan allocated no funds for the cleanup. Russia's Emergencies Ministry conceded that 15% of its high Arctic zone is critically polluted. And as climate change advances, the problem is becoming even more critical. Following a series of alarming incidents in late 2020, including the largest ever Arctic oil spill in Norilsk, Federal Prison Service spokesperson Elena Korobkova announced plans to make inmates clean up the chronically ignored waste. But this presents its own unique set of implications, given the country's history of forced prison labor. Either way, it'll take years of intensive efforts to clear out the massive loads of pollution from Russia's high Arctic. Number 3. Governor in Wreck in 1915, the endurance vessel carrying Antarctic explorer Sir Ernest Shackleton and his crew was crushed by sea ice in the Weddell Sea. The wreck happened 800 miles from Foyne Harbor, where the Norwegian whaling ship Governoren functioned as a floating factory. At the end of the 1915 whaling season, just days after the endurance sank to its watery grave, the Governoren's crew threw a party to celebrate their upcoming journey home. But they had a little too much fun dancing and drinking, and someone knocked an oil lamp off a table, causing the ship to catch on fire. The large amount of whale oil aboard the ship further fueled the blaze. With no other choice, the captain and crew abandoned the ship and watched from nearby as it became engulfed in flames. Luckily, all 85 crew members escaped uninjured and were rescued by another whaling vessel. 
The Governoran still sits in Foyne Harbor today, where the rusting remains serve as a reminder of the catastrophic economic loss that the fire caused after one misstep by an overly jubilant worker who was excited to go see their family. Number 2. Norwegian Coal Mines Norway's coal mining industry really took off during the late 19th and early 20th centuries when numerous settlements were established throughout the rugged Svalbard archipelago. For some companies, these glory days were short-lived. It was already difficult and barely profitable to transport coal to port via a series of aerial tramways when global coal prices dropped, making the process even less prosperous. But more coal mining operations came and went, and some are still in business today. Many have been abandoned along the way, leaving the islands littered with deserted industrial buildings, waste piles, and transport infrastructure. There are also mining settlements, including Hior Thamen, which operated from 1917 to 1921. The future of Svalbard's few remaining coal mining sites remains uncertain. In recent years, the Norwegian government has announced that it wants to see an end to this environmentally unfriendly industry and that it plans to close down the handful of mines that are still operating. Most of the abandoned sites are open to tourists, but anyone who wishes to explore should keep in mind that Svalbard experiences a two-and-a-half-month period of complete darkness every year from mid-November to late January. There's limited daylight right before and right after this period, but the best time to visit is between March and September. Number 1. The Distant Early Warning DEW Line in 1954, U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower commissioned a network of early warning radar stations high above the Arctic Circle to warn of an impending aircraft or missile attack on North America from the polar region. It took a little over two years to build the chain of 63 stations, which stretched 3,000 miles from Alaska to Greenland along the 69th parallel. Most of the stations were located in Canada. The distant early warning line operated for less than a decade before the development of Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles ICBMs, began to render its technology obsolete. Because the radar stations were only equipped to detect subsonic aircraft and missiles, they were ill-equipped to warn of an incoming ICBM attack. By 1963, nearly all of the line's intermediate sites were decommissioned and their four- to five-person crews left the stations behind. The employees were given just an hour's notice before they had to evacuate. Starting in the late 1980s, some of the stations that were still in operation were incorporated into the DEW line's successor, the North Warning System. During the mid-1990s, there was a massive cleanup of the left-behind stations which had basically turned into open dumps full of debris. Only a few of the abandoned DEW line stations remain today. Two of them are reportedly sinking into the Greenland ice cap, which is thousands of feet thick and will soon disappear. No efforts were made to preserve any of the sites except the LIZ-2 station in Point Lay, Alaska. These derelict properties are strewn with rusting equipment and decaying buildings. Many of these structures are half buried in snow, which has made its way into the crumbling interiors. Number 10. An Underwater Vehicle Museum Vehicles get into accidents and sink sometimes. It just happens. But they're also submerged on purpose for a number of reasons. In 2019, Jordanian authorities lowered 19 decommissioned military vehicles into the Red Sea in hopes of attracting tourists to the nearby resort city of Aqaba. The collection of drowned hardware includes tanks, an ambulance, a military crane, a troop carrier, a combat helicopter, an anti-aircraft battery, and several guns. They're arranged in a tactical formation along a coral reef 92 feet underwater. The project was the brainchild of the Akaba Special Economic Zone Authority, which has turned to wreck diving in recent years as a way to draw in more visitors and more of their money. In fact, most of the wrecks around Akaba were sunk deliberately. The tradition of deliberately scuttling vehicles also stems from the Jordanian royal family's passion for diving, which goes back generations. In 1985, the late King Abdullah ordered the sinking of a Spanish cargo vessel called the Cedar Pride. Three years earlier, an accident had blasted a hole in the ship, leaving a half-submerged eyesore until the king decided it belonged on the sea bottom. An anti-aircraft tank became the second intentionally placed wreck off Aqaba in 1999. There are also a few sunken airplanes, a landing boat, and a crane barge. So, if exploring waterlogged vehicles is your thing, Akaba might be your type of place. Number 9. Okobira Hotel In early 2020, two young men entered the abandoned Okobira Hotel in Abino City, Japan, perhaps to stave off their pandemic boredom. The hotel hasn't operated in decades, and rumor has it that the ninth floor is haunted. They traveled up to the sixth floor and were shocked to find a decaying body lying face up in a bed. The remains were too decomposed for police to provide the person's approximate age and gender. No personal belongings or identifying items were found nearby. The individual was eventually identified as a local resident in his 50s. 
It's apparently common in Japan for abandoned buildings to stand for years or even decades after shuttering their doors. A reporter for the Mayanichi recently set out to learn why. Residents said that people had been trespassing into the Okobira Hotel for years and that they'd like to see it torn down. But the company that owned the building was dissolved, and if the local government gets too involved, it could become responsible for maintaining the dilapidated hotel, which is starting to fall apart and become dangerous. And it would be risky to demolish the building because it would be extremely difficult to go after the former owner for the cost, meaning that it might ultimately come at the taxpayer's expense. So for now, this and other creepy deserted sites remain in a legal limbo of sorts while they fall further into disrepair. Number 8. Cavern of Lost Souls A few years ago, an explorer named Gareth Owen decided to investigate an abandoned slate mine in Wales that had closed around 60 years earlier. Much to his surprise, he discovered that the cave, nicknamed the Cavern of Lost Souls, now functions as an underground junkyard. He found it filled with dozens of cars piled on top of one another, cascading into a pool of blue water. Eerie photos captured by Owen show that the vehicles are mostly unrecognizable, but there's one blue Ford Cortina sitting on top of the heap in one piece. Most of the cars inside the 200-foot deep mine are from the 1970s onward, which makes sense since the site became a dumping ground after the mine closed in 1960. As fascinating as the site is, he pointed out that it's a reminder of a time when people were less worried about pollution. But it's not all bad, according to Owen, who cited the junk pile as a reminder of how far the country had come in its efforts to be more environmentally aware. His photos went viral, prompting other urban explorers to go check the site out for themselves. Sadly, the site has reportedly been trashed and covered in graffiti, making it impossible for future visitors to enjoy it in the condition Owen found it in. Number 7. Kolyuchin Island Located just seven miles from the northern shore of the Chukotka Peninsula, Kolyuchin Island sits above the Arctic Circle in Russia's Far East. There's an indigenous settlement along its northern shore, but it's otherwise uninhabited by humans. The island is home to a collection of abandoned structures that were built during the 1930s, including a polar station. Unfortunately, it also served as a dumping ground for empty fuel barrels during the Soviet era, with as many as 12 million of the containers scattered along the coast. Last year, Russian photographer Dmitry Koch traveled throughout the Russian Arctic snapping pictures of polar bears. He didn't really expect to find them at Kolyuchin Island, but he stopped there anyway. Much to his surprise, the island had been pretty much taken over by the giant furry Arctic beasts who have made their way into the deserted buildings. Yep, the polar bears moved right in. Speaking with DIY Photography, Koch described his encounter with the bears as a once-in-a-lifetime event. As excited as he was, however, he expressed his disappointment about how the creatures have to live among the garbage and pollution left behind by humans. Number 6. Deserted Airbnb If you're familiar with Airbnb, then you know that it can be a very good thing or a very bad thing. When done right, the app connects responsible guests with reliable hosts and the exact type of property the renter is looking for. But things occasionally go wrong on either or both ends, and it doesn't take much for a disaster to strike. British couple Sebastian and Amy Alexander recently booked a room at what they thought was a luxury hotel in Costa Rica for a planned New Year's Eve trip. But when they arrived, they quickly realized that the property was abandoned. Instead of the lush, well-lit building featured in the ad, the pair encountered a dismal, fenced-off shell of what used to be an upscale hotel. While at a bar next door trying to figure out what to do, some locals told Sebastian and Amy that the owner shuttered the business two years ago when the pandemic hit. The couple had shelled out around $1,350 for the stay and had to pay another $2,700 to spend their vacation elsewhere. They told the press that it took Airbnb five days to respond to them after they contacted the company. Describing the experience as a holiday from hell, Sebastian said that he and his wife are experienced travelers and they never had something like that happen to them until now. He also said that he never wanted to use Airbnb again. Have you ever had a bad experience with Airbnb? Tell us about it in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Number 5. Florida Funeral Home It's unfortunately not uncommon to see news headlines about funeral home staff doing disturbing things to cut costs, even when it means mishandling bodies that grieving families have entrusted them to prepare properly for burial. A 40-year-old YouTuber named Rob, who runs the channel RNK All Day, recently gained access to one such establishment, which has sat abandoned since 2012 in Wadesboro, North Carolina. The McLendon Funeral Home made headlines numerous times for allegedly abusing corpses. In 2014, two years after the business was shut down, three rotting bodies were found inside. Rob was taken to the rundown business by a local resident. They found a slew of shocking items, including bags of cremated human remains, coffins, photos of dead bodies, and more. 
The building still contains the furniture it used for performing funeral services and the equipment that was used for preparing bodies. There's a gravestone engraved with the name Daisy B. Hunt and the dates 1934 to 2004. You'll find a mattress left behind by squatters and a stuffed animal. Two bags of ashes contained labels dated 1995 and 1999 with personal details attached. Rob captured footage of the frightening scene, explaining that the funeral home's owner failed to do right by her customers and that she was neglectful and criminal in her actions. He went on to say that he couldn't imagine what it would be like if someone mistreated one of his loved ones in such a horrifying fashion. Number 4. The Drowned Village of Villarino de Ferna Every now and then when a dry spell causes water levels to drop in Portugal's Minho region, the ruins of a 2,000-year-old town appear. Known as Villarino de Ferna, the crumbling settlement was submerged after construction began on a nearby dam in 1967. The Portuguese electric company built the reservoir to bring large-scale hydroelectric power to the region. Residents of the small village of 300 were paid to move. Some went reluctantly, but they eventually all cleared out, with the last resident leaving in 1971. The town was submerged the following year and has been all but lost to history, with its occasional reappearances and a small nearby museum serving as the only reminders that it's there. According to word of mouth, it was founded by Romans during the first century and grew to be quite prosperous. Visitors are unlikely to see the ruins because fluctuating water levels make it dangerous to take a boat near them, and most locals aren't willing to take the risk. Number 3. Human Remains Inside an Abandoned Church Detectives in Akron, Ohio were recently led to an abandoned church building owned by the Greater Faith Missionary Baptist Church of Akron after a tipster revealed a gruesome discovery. An urban explorer had entered the church with a friend out of curiosity. Inside, she found dozens of boxes and several white bags stacked against a wall with names, social security numbers, and dates on them. She told local station WKYC that she saw cremation records dated between 2005 and 2020. After snapping some photos, the woman contacted the authorities. The discovery led to the arrest of the church's former pastor, 41-year-old Shanti Harden. He faces a slew of charges including records tampering, failing to file taxes, abuse of a corpse, and engaging in a pattern of corrupt activity. Harden is accused of providing funeral services without a license since 2014. Any experienced urban explorer knows that there's always a chance they'll come across something spooky or upsetting during their investigations. Speaking with WKYC, the woman who discovered the abandoned remains said it wasn't scary. It was sad and disturbing, just shocking. Based on some of the information she saw, some of the ashes belonged to children. Authorities are now tasked with finding the surviving family members and returning their loved ones' ashes to them. Number 2. Extremely Rare Cars While rummaging through an abandoned roadside garage in the UK, a YouTube user who goes by the name M. Stuxy found a handful of extremely rare vehicles, including two pre-World War II BMWs. The cars are likely what's known as Fraser Nash BMWs, meaning they were imported, assembled, and sold by the British sports car brand Fraser Nash Limited as part of a partnership that lasted from 1934 to 1939. While this lowers the value of the vehicles a little bit, they're still incredibly rare and worth quite a lot. One of the cars bears the Fraser Nash emblem, while the other only has the BMW logo. They appear to be two-door 327 models, which means they were built sometime between 1937 and 1941. Around 2,000 were made before World War II broke out and production ground to a halt. It's a complete mystery why and how they ended up stashed away in what seems to be a deserted shed. In addition to the BMWs, Auto Evolution reported that the Explorer found some vintage Norton bikes, an old Triumph, a Land Rover 110, and around a dozen European classic cars dating back between the 1960s and the 80s. Number 1. A Ruined City in the Forest Deep in the woods on Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia, Canada are the crumbling ruins of one of Canada's first planned communities. The idea for the city known as Broughton came in the early 20th century after a coal seam was discovered in the area. British mining engineer Thomas Lancaster and businessman Colonel Harris Mayhew set out to harvest the coal. As part of their plan, they designed what was supposed to be the infrastructure for a thriving city of 10,000 to 12,000 residents with 10 miles of streets. Investors poured millions into the project. Streets were laid out, buildings were constructed, and a luxurious hotel and resort there had the first revolving door in North America. But Broughton's existence was short-lived and the population never grew nearly as big as it was built for. When Lancaster and Mayhew's coal company went bankrupt in 1907, the city's residents moved away and both men left the area for England. The Canadian Army took over the city during World War I and used it as a training headquarters. Around 1,200 soldiers were housed in the former hotels and homes. But once the war was over, they cleared out and Broughton was once again left empty. 
It was never lived in again and slowly succumbed to the forces of nature, which have almost entirely reclaimed the site. All that's left now are the crumbling foundations of several buildings. A person who's walking through the woods and isn't familiar with the area's history would surely wonder what they just encountered. It's an eerie sight, to say the least, to see the deteriorating structures left behind by Mayhew and Lancaster's failed vision. Some even say that the ruins are haunted by the ghosts of miners and soldiers who lived there for a short time. Number 9. Terry Burka Graveyard This abandoned location used to be a thriving fishing community and is now known for its rusty remnants. The village of Terry Burka in Russia is famous to audiences worldwide thanks to its featuring in the 2014 film Leviathan. That movie was nominated for an Oscar. Situated on the coast of the Barents Sea, Terry Burka features a striking and creepy graveyard made up of boats that people just didn't need anymore. Buildings and houses were left behind as the population shrank. Thousands of people used to call this place home. Today, it has the dubious honor of being the most well-known Russian village on Instagram. After the fall of communism in the 1980s, much like many other areas in the former Soviet Union, the once thriving fishing village began to deteriorate. Tourism is now the primary economic driver of the area. Tourists are reportedly keen to see the abandoned vessels for themselves and take snaps for social media. You'll also find outsiders arriving to check out the place for other reasons. One of these is Terry Burka's access to the famed Northern Lights. The place is pretty dead, we guess, but still manages to come to life thanks to that and attractions such as the ship's graveyard. Terry Burka isn't the ideal tourism destination for everyone, but if you're not put off by the semi-abandoned village's limited accommodations, you can check out this fascinating abandoned place. Grim but compelling stuff, we're sure you'll agree. Number 8. Bose 400 Cape Town This is a shipwreck with a bit of a twist. You see, it's also a crane. Yes, you heard that right. A whole crane actually washed up near Hoot Bay, which is a South African suburb. Sounds unlikely, but it happened. How? Well, the crane is attached to a barge, which itself was part of an oil rig. Check out that platform there, which is angled precariously over the water and rocks, giving us vertigo just looking at it. Belonging to the French, the BOS 400 was in the process of being towed away in 1994. The boat dragging the massive oil rig was not strong enough to manage the task, and as a result, the rope broke and it then ran aground. There it stayed with the possibility of rescuing it virtually non-existent. Now the magnificently eerie abandoned oil rig has become an unusual landmark. Though not many know about its existence and it's not easy to get close enough to observe it. The walk along the coastline to reach it, however, is described as beautiful. So if you enjoy abandoned relics and are ever in the area of Sandy Bay and Cape Town, it's worth the trek. Number 7. Breakwall Powell River Concrete ships? Sounds counterintuitive, but they were in use during both World War I and World War II. Concrete ships are built of steel and reinforced concrete instead of more traditional materials. The materials are cheap, readily available, and were a solution during steel shortages. A fleet of concrete ships and barges were used to support U.S. and British invasions in Europe and the Pacific in 1944 and 1945. Hence this magnificent site in the area of Powell River, British Columbia, Canada a break wall made up of 10 surviving ships. Arranging them in a wall-type formation allowed the Powell River Company paper mill to create a barrier for its logging pond. Things have changed since then and the break wall doesn't seem to serve much of a purpose today. Out of the many concrete ships that were built during the World Wars, 10 remain afloat in a massive floating breakwater on the Malaspina Strait, which can be found in the city of Powell River, British Columbia in Canada. Originally put in place to protect a paper mill, the ships were reconfigured in 2002. What is the next step for these fascinating crafts? Well, plans have reportedly been made to scupper them somewhere, i.e. send them to a watery grave in order to make them become an artificial reef. There, divers can explore an important part of wartime heritage in an entirely new way. Plus, we're sure fish and other types of marine life will enjoy colonizing the new reef. Number 6. Neukrotomy Baltisk the Russian frigate Neukrotomy first hit the water in the late 1970s. It lasted all the way till the late noughties and currently sits submerged in water at Baltisk Naval Base, part of the Kaliningrad Oblast. How did it get into this sorry state? Let's take a look at the history of this once proud, now very much abandoned vessel. In its capacity as a naval frigate, the ship naturally traveled all around the world, in trips from Poland to Nigeria, for example. However, as the 20th century got underway, things didn't look good for the Neukrotomy. An explosion on board in 2005 at St. Petersburg led to the hull being seriously damaged. From there, it was only a matter of time before its days were numbered. 
Records show that tragedy struck again three years later, owing to an electrical fire. The following year, the frigate was decommissioned. By 2012, it had sunk at the Baltisk Naval Base K. The Navy built these ships for heavy duty, and in the case of the Neukrotomy, they sure weren't kidding. Would you dive this wreck if you could? Tell me in the comments, and while you're at it, make sure to subscribe to the channel so you never miss a video. Number 5. Francisco Morazan, South Manitou Island This cargo freighter ran aground approximately 60 years ago and calls the shore of South Manitou Island, Lake Michigan, home. Originally, the vessel hailed from Liberia, West Africa. In 1960, the ship was going from Chicago to Holland via the Great Lakes when it encountered terrible weather conditions. A combination of powerful winds and low visibility through snow and fog resulted in the Francisco Morazan colliding with dry land. Information on the vessel is quite detailed. The person responsible for the voyage was one Captain Trevisas. While he was experienced on the water, this was his first rodeo as far as being captain was concerned. What a way to start a job, right? To raise the stakes a little higher, he was joined by his wife who was pregnant. Thankfully, everyone seems to have been rescued and made it off the wreck. But what about the boat? Amazingly, the owners were elusive and so the Francisco Morazan's fate was sealed. You'd think whoever owned this beauty would be easy to get a hold of, but unfortunately, that was not the case at all. By the way, if you're wondering who Francisco Morazan, the boat's namesake, was, he served as President of the Federal Republic of Central America throughout the 1830s. Regarded as a major political thinker, he also made his name through the Battle of La Trinidad in 1827. It's sad that something with such an illustrious name has wound up in such a broken-down state. However, it sounds like the Great Lakes were showing no mercy that day. You've probably heard the old-fashioned expression that the sea is a cruel mistress. Well, turns out that Lake Michigan can be a rough body of water to tangle with as well. Number 4. SS Airfield Homebush Bay Is it a boat? Is it a garden? Really, it's both. The SS Airfield contains mangrove trees which kind of fan out like a peacock's tail. This strange appearance naturally led to its nickname of the Floating Forest. In a previous life, it was a steam collier ship, originally coming from the UK in 1911. What's a collier ship? It's a cargo vessel designed for transporting coal. When World War II broke out, the SS Airfield, known as the Korimal, became a transport ship for the Australian war effort. What happens when a ship like this goes into retirement? It heads to a retirement home of sorts, specifically Homebush Bay in Sydney, which used to be quite polluted due to chemicals in the water from the airfield and a range of other World War II vessels. The idea was that the craft would be dismantled, but this job wasn't finished. It was then that the rather surprising development of a forest sprouted up. And it's a good thing that the airfield was left abandoned because it went on to become quite a talking point in the end. After all, how many boats do you get with trees growing out of them? It makes for a pretty fascinating end result. Number 3. SS Maheno, Fraser Island Found in Queensland, Australia, the wreck of the SS Maheno is a tourist attraction on Fraser Island, also known as Kagari or Gari. Sitting abandoned on 75 Mile Beach, it's fascinating but also dangerous. We should point out that visitors are advised not to get too close to this unstable local feature. How long has it been there? Close on to a hundred years by now. And what a dynamic journey this ship has had. Believe it or not, this used to be a relaxing mode of transportation, taking well-heeled passengers from place to place. In 1905, the Maheno took to the water, traveling between Sydney and Auckland, not to mention other locations. Not that it had an entirely charmed life. For a time, it was used as a floating hospital, so it saw its fair share of drama before ending up as a world-famous wreck. 1935 saw it heading to Japan. Why was it going there? To die, essentially. The poor Maheno had outlived its usefulness and presumably was going to become a source of spare parts. Yet fate had different plans altogether. A cyclone ensured the ship never reached its final destination. It was blown onto 75 Mile Beach, though that wasn't the end of the story. Unlike others on this list, there was interest in getting the Maheno back on its sea legs. This was a logistical nightmare by the sounds of things, and of course eventually people threw in the towel and let the boat see out the rest of its days in a sweet spot overlooking the water. Number 2. Edward Boland Skeletal Coast Is there a scarier place to end up than the Skeleton Coast in Namibia? The name alone sounds like something from a Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Numerous wrecks can be spotted in the area, which is known for its treacherous, foggy conditions. One of these is the Edward Bolin, a cargo ship hailing from far away in Germany. The ship has had the misfortune to be at this place for well over a hundred years. It first hit the sand in 1909, though some sources state 1907, during a journey between the city of Swakopmund in Namibia and Table Bay on the Cape Peninsula. We hope the crew made it out of there, though if they did, they surely suffered in the scorching heat. 
An interesting fact about the Edward Bolin is how far it is from the water. A distance has been mentioned of a thousand feet. So why the distance? You'd think that it dropped out from the sky rather than washed up. The thing is, the desert sands here act almost like an animal, consuming things in its path, including the water line. This formerly formidable craft looks as if it's being gobbled up with each passing year. If you're brave or foolhardy enough to venture down there, you may want to change your mind. Why? There's usually a surprise waiting inside of the boat in the form of jackals. Yes, apparently they use the wreck as a shelter to avoid the punishing sun. Practical though it is, it is not good news for unwary human visitors looking to explore the interior. It's also worth mentioning briefly the other major wrecks that met their maker on the Skeleton Coast. There's the Dunedin Star, which comes from Liverpool and has been there since 1942. You can probably guess what led to it being on the coast from the year it landed. If you haven't, well, the Second World War was on and the wartime activity saw the boat get into trouble and become shipwrecked. There's something of a story here too, with not only a tugboat but also a plane getting stuck in the area, either by going around or crashing in the sea. The other wreck is that of the Swiderkus, which hit the coast in 1976. Even worse was that this happened during the maiden voyage. Yep, Skeleton Coast sure lives up to its name. Thankfully, most of the skeletons seem to be from boats. Number 1. SS Kakapo, South Africa This next story will be familiar as it shares details with the other entries on our rundown. Though we do have an intriguing development regarding the SS Kakapo that makes it different and interesting. First, let's talk about how it ended up on Long Beach in South Africa. The year was 1900. The ship was transporting coal between the UK and Sydney, not a short haul by any means, and one that was about to come to a dramatic conclusion. Rain was whipped into an impenetrable sheet by a super strong northwesterly wind. Unable to see much through the window as a result, the crew's time on the water was almost up. Reportedly, they thought they were headed for a place called Cape Point. Unfortunately, their actual destination was the similar-looking Chapman's Peak, spelling big trouble. For the boat, that is. Fortunately, the crew managed to make it out unscathed, which is where things get a little crazy. The captain reportedly took the situation hard. Now, this is probably a tall tale, but apparently what he did was choose to stay on board. How long did he remain on the SS Kakapo? No less than three years. True or not, this is certainly an extremely long period of time to remain on board a wrecked vessel. Anyway, he probably didn't anticipate his former ship becoming a tourist attraction. It doesn't sound like the easiest place in the world to get to, and the official advice is not to go alone and to take care when admiring the partially covered wreck. Thanks for watching. Are there any incredible abandoned ships that you think we left out? Let us know in the comments down below. Be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next time for another amazing video right here on American Eye.